Stephen Wang is currently a senior at Harker, and his research on engineering new cancer models was catalyzed by his interest in challenging the uncertainties in science. Stephen conducted his most recent work with Stanford University and has been honored as an Intel Science Talent Search finalist, though his work faced some challenges, such as contaminated incubators and computer failures. In addition to being an avid researcher, Stephen enjoys researching current events for debate, participating in hip-hop routines, and playing baseball. In the future, Stephen aspires to study biomedical engineering in college and eventually become a leading cancer research professor or a physician. Okay, so hi everyone, my name is Steven, and I'm presenting my project, Commuter-Aided Genomic Characterization of Colorectal Cancer Driver Alterations for Oncogenic Transformation of Primary Colon Organoids. So the main problem in current cancer discovery is finding out how to combat colorectal tumor genesis, which essentially is the creation of new tumors in the colon or rectal region, and is usually developed through the accumulation of deleterious mutations on a genomic level. So this may involve a somatic cell or an unaltered cell that develops mutations such as alterations in the KRAS gene, which is an oncogene, or the P53 gene, and other alterations may also contribute to this process. But the main problem is that each subtype of colorectal cancer is different, which means that we cannot create a uniform model of how cancer actually grows unless we discover other driver genes which may contribute to each individual's tumor case. In addition to these problems, we also face limitations of current methods in order to characterize the cancer genome. So the first problem arises when we consider the complexity of cancer genes and how we actually identify genes that may cause cancer versus ones that may just arise on a random basis and don't drive the progression of this disease. So for example, cancer initiating genes or alterations may include qualities that allow cancer to, prol to proliferate on a genomic scale, such as evading apoptosis, which is a death mechanism, or allowing the tumor to grow due to an abundance of growth factors. Now, in addition, even if we were to identify specific loci of cancer alterations that will be used to drive the progression of this disease, a second problem then arises. Current two-dimensional cancer models are unable to re recapitulate the tumor microenvironment, meaning that it's incredibly hard to model how a tumor actually grows because of current cell culture methods. In fact, shown here is the tumor microenvironment. And because cell culture dishes right now only supply a two-dimensional model, we're unable to capture all these other different components of the microenvironment, which is crucial to understanding how a tumor will grow in a real human body. So with that in mind, there have been many approaches to actually combat some of these problems. And the most promising one seems to be the organoid model, which is shown here, in which minced tissue is then implanted into a collagen-based layer and is suspended in this essential three-dimensional matrix. And this allows a wide variety of applications, from an experimental tool to allow us to understand how stem cells differentiate within the culture niche, to allowing diagnostic tools for cystic fibrosis or a therapeutic tool for understanding the basis of diseases such as colorectal cancer, as I'll go on in my study. So essentially, the purpose of my project was then to combine these two aspects and address these challenges into one cohesive framework. So this involved first discovering new colorectal cancer driver genes and then testing them in an experimental organoid validation model. So specifically, I looked at a subset of alterations called copy number alterations, which are essentially segments of the DNA that are either deleted or amplified on a genomic scale, which means that we suspect that if a segment of a, of a DNA is alterated in a cancer cell versus a normal cell, we'd expect it to be an oncogene which could drive tumor growth. On the other hand, if we have a region of the DNA that is deleted, then we could suspect that this could be a tumor suppressor function, and likewise, we could reactivate it using some therapeutic target. Now, after I identified these alterations, I then wanted to test them in this organoid model. So this involved genotyping to ensure that we could accurately allow the um, minced tissue to reflect our phenotypic changes that we could engineer into these organoids. And then we would propagate the organoids, infect them with viruses, 
and then finally observe how the tumor grows after oncogenic transformation. So the first step of my study involved actually discovering the driver regions that may contribute to colorectal cancer. And so to do this, I mined data from the gene expression omnibus by combining three different data sets into one cohesive um, heterogeneous data set. And I did this because this would allow me to have a wide variety of colorectal cancer tumors from things like metastasis to simply primary tumor sites. I then applied the GISTIC algorithm, which essentially takes the amplification of each of these alterations from my data set and measures the frequency of them on the genomic scale. And if they reach such threshold as shown here, then we can consider them to be statistically significant. And after that, we could then find regions of the DNA which we could identify either as amplified genes or deleted genes, which we could implicate as corresponding oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes. So from this, I found a numerous, um, a, a numerous amount of alterations that could be linked to colorectal cancer. And some prominent names may be included as, such as PI3KCA, RBFOX3, P53, RBI, P10, and APC. But some other interesting genes also arose, such as the WWOX gene, which I'll go into later, um, the JAK1 gene, which is involved in the JAK-STAT pathway, and um, other genes such as LPA, EYS, and T-SPAN4. So in order to actually narrow this exhaustive list down to a single cohesive amount of genes that I could investigate further for colorectal cancer, I then used a multi-dimensional framework and using different types of analysis in order to narrow the list down into probable oncogenes or probable tumor suppressor genes. So this involved different tests from the Cancer Genome Atlas, including copy number analysis, genomic data, and survival correlation values, combined with ingenuity pathway analysis in order to discover these potential oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So the first step using the Cancer Genome Atlas, which comprised around 600 different colorectal cancer samples, included actually validating that these regions of the DNA were actually amplified or deleted. And so as we find here, we saw that the amplified genes that I found in my previous geoanalysis was essentially the same as the ones found in my TCGA analysis, and the same with the tumor suppressor genes. I additionally applied um, different analysis using the Ingenuity IPA to find actual functional pathways that these genes may lead to. And it's obviously we find a lot of cell death and survival pathways, which makes sense because if the oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes were involved in the proliferation of cancer, then they would likely have many roles in cancer survival or proliferation. So after that, I then also tried to construct different networks of these genes in order to discover other, I guess, functional ways in which these genes could contribute to colorectal cancer, such as pathway mechanisms. And so the most highly, I guess, represented pathway was things like the Wnt beta catenin pathway, which has a strong foundation of cancer biology, and the PI3K AKT signaling, which ha also has a corresponding growth-promoting role. So after I conducted this network analysis, I then wanted to investigate whether gene expression correlations were also correlated with the copy number analysis that I ran in my previous analysis. So I essentially compared the TCGA samples uh, using the copy number analysis and discovered whether the deleted genes showed a lower gene expression or mRNA concentration and whether the amplified genes showed a corresponding increase in mRNA expression. And I saw exactly that correlation where these six genes showed essentially statistically significant correlation through gene expression and copy number analysis. So for example, IKBKB is an amplified gene, but it also shows heightened mRNA expression when it's amplified on the cancer genome. And similarly, WWOX gene, which I elaborated previously, shows the same corresponding function as when it's deleted in tumor samples, it shows a lower mRNA expression and corresponding gene expression. So finally, I then wanted to apply survival analysis and wanted to discover which genes were correlated with lower patient survival. And so I found one gene in particular that showed statistical significance to this correlation, which was the WWOX gene or the WOX gene. 
And so essentially I found that when it's alterated or deleted in colorectal cancer patients, we saw lower survival than when it's simply at its unaltered state, which seriously implicates it as a tumor suppressor gene as this may lead to the alterations or alteration needed to actually drive the progression of cancer on a genomic level. So after discovering all these different modules that could be linked to colorectal cancer, I then wanted to experimentally validate them in this organoid system. And so this involved actually propagating the organoids in this air liquid interface method, and which involved allowing a collagen base layer to form and then embedding the mince tissue in another base layer to allow air to come from the top and nutrients to come from the bottom to sustain the organoid culture. And here are just a couple pictures of some organoids that I created. After that, I then wanted to ensure that the organoids were of the same genotype that I experimentally wanted to. And so I engineered different organoids based on three different genes, the KRAS gene, the APC gene, and the P53 gene. And using combinations of, of these genes, I verified them through gel electrophoresis and PCR to ensure that they're of the right genotype. And likewise, I then used the um, adenovirus in order to infect the organoids and essentially create them to be the desired phenotype that I wanted to. So after I engineered these organoids, I then wanted to actually discover how they'd grow in different settings. So this involved using time-lapse imaging of different combinations of the organoid engineered models. So for example, the wild-type control only got the adenovirus FC, which means that it essentially had an unaltered state that didn't have any sort of alterations in them. Well, otherwise, the APC gene, the KRAS mutation, and the KRAS and P53 knockout all showed ex exhibited growth, as shown by the time-lapse imaging, compared to the control group. And we saw that these differences were statistically significant when we were measuring diametric expansion. So just here is an example of when we're using a spot microscopy photo, how from day one, the organoid grew extensively to day 19. So in conclusion, my project successfully identified new drivers for colorectal cancer and specifically found one gene in particular, the WOX gene, to be probably a tumor suppressor gene. I additionally validated some of these genes in a novel organoid culture, which showed promise in future oncogene validation for other genes I discovered in my study. So in the future, I then want to continue to expand upon this analysis by discovering even more alterations and also allowing them to be capitulated in the tumor microenvironment through the organoid model. I then also want to integrate different types of analysis such as the CRISPR-Cas9 system to allow myself to input specific mutations in the cancer genome, which would allow the functionality of the organoid system to grow expansively. I then also want to take further analysis such as histology to discover whether these changes would be found on a more histological scale rather than just looking at a spot view from the microscope. Uh, here are my references. And I'd like to thank some uh, special people here. First, my mentors, Dr. Calvin Kuo and Dr. Michael Cantrell, who advised me on the project, and also pretty much everyone else in the laboratory who advised me on different aspects of the project. I'd also like to thank Mr. Spender and, and Ms. Chetty from the Harker School for taking the time to really give me the opportunity to revise my paper and ma really make it ready for different competitions. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience and all of you for listening. Thank you. We now have time for our Q&A session. We will be using Slido, so you can submit questions through your phone at slido.com with the hashtag symposium. Okay, so I guess the first question um, was, what was the mentor-mentee relationship you had when you did your research? Um, so I guess I could describe it as a very supportive environment there. Um, my mentors and especially my principal investigator didn't really, I guess, see me as someone who's at a lower position than them. They found me as more of someone who's willing to work in the lab. And so obviously there's a lot of collaboration there. I got to 
really be on the forefront of the organoid research and got to conduct my own experiments. So um, I find that it was really useful to just have that relationship that allowed me to collaborate with them freely instead of maybe being a bit reserved in the lab. Also, I guess the laboratory niche was also really fun as I, we did a lot of fun activities such as just go out and eat lunch together or watch movies or, um, so I guess the whole relationship is, is very, it, it's a very cohesive relationship that I really enjoy in the lab. Um, the next question is, what are the applications of my work? So um, obviously it has a lot of applications to organoid research and cell culture methods. And so this means that we can essentially take other genes that have been discovered before and put them in the organoid system, which may have applications in discovering how tumors will grow on a more patient-to-patient -patient basis. And this also goes along with personalized medicine as if we were to create different organoid models for each individual patient, we could test like therapies to see which ones will actually work on the first try, which will have huge applications in the medical industry. Um, another one is, why is your title so long? Break it down for me. Uh, so, okay, so essentially, um, I guess my title is Computer-Aided Genomic Characterization of Colorectal Cancer Alterations for Oncogenic Transformation of Primary orga Colon Organoids. So <laughs> this, I, I guess if I were to break it down for you, it'd mean that I use computers to essentially characterize the differences between cancer and normal cells to find different pinpoints on the, on the genomic lo level, and that also means that I could test some of these genomic alterations in this organoid system by engineering different organoids and seeing how, how they would grow under these conditions. I don't think there's any other questions. So. Are there any more questions? Yeah. So I really came up with this um, idea when, because I'm really interested in both the biological and I guess computer aspects of cancer biology. So I was really interested in finding new ways to integrate different big types of data because there's a lot of publicly available databases such as the TCG and Geo databases which I use and I really wanted to utilize them. But at the same time, I also wanted to kind of experience the wet lab side of research in which I really wanted to kind of experiment with cell culture dishes and really do something that's, uh, that's in the real world environment instead of something on the computer. And so this research project really allowed me to kind of integrate both of these focuses into a really cohesive project. And the reason why I chose colon cancer was mainly because the organoid model is kind of suited for intestinal cancers. So for example, we can kind of divide things in the intestine, like the small intestine, into repeating chains of a single unit, in which the small intestine could be kind of characterized as repeating chains of a single villi. But we can't do the same thing for things like breast tissue or for, I guess, uh, like the brain, because these types of tissues are so heterogeneous and diverse that we really can't use the organoid model at this moment in order to kind of replicate these microenvironments of these types of tissue types. So really the intestinal area is why the organoid model is so applicable because it can essentially model one of these single units that is essentially comprises the entire um, organ like the small intestine or the colon. We have time for the last three questions on the Slido screen. Okay, so um, what was the hardest part of your project? I would say the hardest part would be the computational analysis that I conducted because the lab that I worked in essentially didn't do any sort of computer work at all. So I had to learn a lot of the programs that I used um, on my own in order to find like which programs would analyze which databases. And so I guess it was really frustrating at first because I didn't really know how all these databases worked and how these analysis tools function. So it took me a long time to really get into how these different modules actually were, how they could be set up and which formats they needed to be in. Uh, the next question is, when a cancer cell suppresses a gene that can either destroy 
or disable a cancerous cell, is the suppressed gene permanently gone? So I would say that it's, first of all, the question is kind of, I guess it's misleading in that the cancer cell itself doesn't uh, knowledgeably suppress a gene, but in that it can acquire mutations that might suppress the gene. So I guess I would say that it all depend on how the cancer is growing. So for example, there are some sites, especially in the P53 gene, that you can actually reactivate a tumor suppressor gene after it's been mutated. But other times, the mutated gene or alterated gene may be essentially dish, like alterated beyond repair that you essentially would have to find an alternate, alternate uh, pathway in order to reactivate the function. So this may involve like having an activated downstream pathway or kind of disabling the upstream pathway. Uh, okay, the last question would be, you talk about the WOX gene. Most of its functions are related to cardiac structure and cholesterol. How do you think this might have a connection to colorectal cancer? So the WOX gene is very important in the WIT beta catenin pathway, and it has, in, as the question stated, it has huge involvement into metabolism and cholesterol. So one of the main functions was outlined in um, a paper published in Cell, which explained how the WOX gene has huge applications in the metabolic pathways of cancer. So this may involve allowing the cancer cell to speed up its proliferation in order to allow for metabolic applications. Um, but it also has huge, I, I guess, activator functions in genes like the SMAD4 pathway, which is known to allow the proliferation of cancer cells in a much more I guess, macroscopic level, which means that if the WOX gene were deleted, it could lead to the activation of pathways, um, like I mentioned in the Wnt beta catenin pathway and the SMAD4 pathway, which eventually could lead to the outgrowth of cancer. Yeah, so I think that's all the questions we have today. Thank you so much for attending Stephen's talk and for coming to symposium.